Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Here's worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hey there. Welcome to episode 14 of ATL and 29, the podcast that looks at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. My name is Kevin Chenard. Today's guest is Chris Willis of Peachtree Hoops, who, in my recollection, now holds the unofficial streak as the longest consecutively tenured Hawks blogger. Chris and I discuss the tiers of the Eastern Conference as we try to figure out what has gone pear-shaped on the Hawks this season and what the team might do to get things rolling in the right direction. We also hear from Mike Budenholzer on Kyle Korver playing some minutes at a new position, power forward. Today's episode was made possible by Poli Mortgage Group. Poli Mortgage Group, rates, integrity, service. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's get started. We are super pleased to be joined by Chris Willis. Chris is the editor slash manager slash guru of Peachtree Hoops running the site mostly with Brad Rowland. Chris, it's a great pleasure to have you on with us. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I've been a big fan of the podcast, and it's uh, it's an honor to be uh, to be a guest on there. Oh, well, thank you. All right, so you probably know part of the routine here, which means we're going to start you with our three quick questions. Okay, sounds so good. For the first one, if you could literally trade shoes with any NBA player, uh, who are you going to be exchanging footwear with? Uh, I would trade with uh, Joe Johnson, there's no doubt. I mean, one of my favorite things to do was uh, when we would be in the locker room after a game, uh, Joe had an empty locker next to him, and that's where he put all of his shoes. And I would just I would just kind of ease my way over there and just look <laughs> at all of these <laughs> player excuse, exclusive shoes. And, uh, you know, these uh, Jordans, and uh, he's a Jordan guy. And uh, it was just, uh, you know, I had a lot of fun just uh, because that was the first time I'd seen a lot of those shoes in person. Excellent. So you, what are you going to be giving him if we make this a true exchange? Oh man, uh, he's going to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I've got some I've got some Jordans that are near and dear to my heart, but I'm sure he's already got some All right. some of the same one, so uh, you know, he he's going to get gypped in this exchange, but I'm going to be really happy. You're pretty tall. Are they going to fit him? Uh, I don't know, man. He's a pretty big guy too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right all right uh second question out of all the podcasts and all the episodes of podcasts what's your favorite episode ever oh uh well i had a hard time narrowing this down i, I listen to a ton of podcasts but uh um i'm going to go with richard dotch the si media podcast last year he did uh he did an interview with zach Lowe, who's my favorite uh favorite nba writer and then i believe a week later did one with hubie brown and, uh, you know, and I know them copping out there with a couple of episodes there and, uh, but, uh, that's like, it's like basketball nirvana for me. I think that was, uh, those are my two favorite podcasts and I, I've, I've got them bookmarked and I listen to them, uh, you know, frequently when I need some inspiration or just want to, you know, just want to get back and, uh, try to get motivated, uh, to doing this. That's perfectly fair. It's, it's kind of how we think of NBA players, too. Like, sometimes if they have, like, the, the two 50-point games in the same week, it's sort of the peak, the peak, and you kind of, they're almost inseparable at that point. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, and I, I want to say, I went, tried to look this up. I couldn't find it. I want to say Zach actually had Hubie on his podcast at some point in the last couple of years, but I couldn't find that. That could have just been me dreaming, you know, and wishing that would happen. But, uh, you know, those are, those are my two guys right there. And I learned so much from them. Anytime I read something Zach writes or any, or watch a game that, you know, Hubie's calling, I just learned so much about the game. I have to say that one of the favorite, one of my favorite things I've ever read about the NBA, uh, and I 
came out a couple of years ago as a reprint and it was like a 1979 or 1980 interview that that Hubie did with the AJC the Atlanta Journal Constitution and boy oh boy that was such a, a great piece because you know just the language of the time and you just got a feel for exactly what the game was like in that era in addition to getting all the the basketball insight that Hubie had yeah I need to I need to look that up uh you know I've got some uh coaching DVDs that Hubie Brown put out back when he was uh you know coach of the Grizzlies and I mean it's just amazing it's just like watching a broadcast near the I mean it's 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 amazing to me how he how he's able to uh you know, do some some of the same things. You know, whether it's uh, you know broadcasting a game or it's uh, you know he's translating, breaking these things down. You know, to and showing high school coaches, uh, you know, how to teach the game. And I, I just think that's uh, that's what makes him unique. Excellent. All right. Third question: If you could buy one NBA jersey or something along those lines on eBay from a former NBA player, what would it be? Or four former NBA player, which player, which kind of jersey, or which item would you get? You know, uh, I mean, this is this is easy, and I knew exactly <laughs> what I was going to say as soon as I read this, and and it's it's really bad of me that I haven't already done this, but I, you know, it's a Dominique Wilkins jersey. Uh, Dominique was the reason I picked up a basketball in the first place. Uh, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways he's probably the reason that I'm still watching the game today and I'm writing about the game. Uh, and I've wanted a Dominique jersey for a long time, but I've just never actually pulled the trigger and uh, bought myself one, you know. So, I mean, that's it's Dominique, no no doubt about that. So we're like mid-80s, white, red, which 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 color? Yeah, I like the, the Pac-Man, the Pac-Man jersey, um, the red, what was it? It had red, a little bit of yellow. With the away, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the that pack that that uh, Pac Man jersey. I think that's the that's the iconic one as far as I'm concerned. That's that's perfect. I was watching Neek the other day, and you you see some of the the coaches and assistant coaches and people just associated with the game, maybe broadcasters that used to be NBA players, and you watch them, you know, go around Phillips, and you know it, it's 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 almost a little bit sad because you watch them and they're almost like limping. They kind of just seem like this collection of disjointed parts. They, they have this asymmetric walk and they, they just look like they were beaten down from the days of playing the game. And then you watch Neek and Neek's just like, he's so spry. You know, he won that three point contest with uh, two chains last week. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he looks good for he... a man of his age. Yeah, I mean, he looks. Sometimes you, you're out there watching him clown around before the game. You wonder if you know he couldn't go in and give you some minutes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he still had to. <laughs> exactly. All right. Now we're going to put you through the grinder. Uh, I'm going to have you participate in our 100 to 200 segment. The idea that you give us some sort of controversial opinion that can be somewhere in between the hun- hundred degree Fahrenheit lukewarm opinion and maybe a 200 degree Fahrenheit opinion that's a little bit more scorchy. So we're going to have you uh, tell us what your opinion is, back it up, and then I will take a guess at how you would have scored it and then you can reveal the score to us. Okay, um, yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but uh, you know, <laughs> but I thought, man, I thought this was a, just an absolutely terrible off season for the Atlanta Ox, and uh, you know, and I think uh, it was mad. It, the nine and two start masked some things a little bit, but uh, you know, I'm not terribly surprised to see them flirting around the 500 mark now, and uh, you know, I just felt like they um, they had they had issues and they needed to make changes. But I thought they made the wrong changes and they addressed the wrong problems. And, um, you know, and that's that's something I've kind of been harping on since the summer. But I, you know, I believe it. And, uh, you know, and to, I really haven't proved me wrong yet. Sure. All right. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of this idea? I was uh, when I went on Nate Duncan's podcast for like the season preview, you know, he was asking me about the Hawks and their off season, And I sort of thought that they were going to be worse from a regular season standpoint but that they might be a little bit more a little bit more productive in the playoffs 
And of course, you know, it's, it's still a question of whether they actually get into the playoffs because, you know, some of the projections now are putting them at like a 40% chance of the playoffs. But really, you know, they're like half a game out or something like that. But assuming that they do get in the playoffs, you know, and you look at what they've done the last couple of weeks in terms of road wins, you know, winning in Toronto, winning in Oklahoma City, is there any chance that when the competition gets better, and the, the stakes get a little higher and the game slows down a little bit, that this is kind of a gritty kind of claw, claw and scratch it out kind of team? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a possibility, and that was something that I really tried to talk myself into, uh, you know, over the as right before the season started, you know, as we were trying to go through our previews and stuff. Uh, but, you know, I mean, my concern now, uh, I feel like they kind of lost their identity a little bit uh, in this 5-13 and 13 stretch. Uh, you know, they haven't shown a lot of mental toughness at times. And, you know, and I think you've got to be that to uh, be successful in the playoffs. And, you know, right now I'm worried about them being able to finish with a favorable seed. You don't want to be the eighth seed and have to play the Cavs in the first round. I don't really know if you want to be the seventh and have to have to play Toronto either sure. you know so they really need to climb up into that middle that middle tier I feel like to uh you know to to get in rhythm and and to be playing well in the playoffs uh you know I think it's there but man it's just it's just been a mess and I don't really have a, a good reason for it. I get asked that it seems like every time they lose people are tweeting at us and wanting to know, well, what's the difference now? And I mean, I can't, it's not just any one thing. It's a lot of things and it's a, uh, you know, and it's not easy. It's just not something that's easy to answer. I don't think. All right. Well, I think we're going to be kind of hitting on this team <laughs> the whole episode of this podcast. So I've got some questions, but I think I'll hold off because we're probably going to get around to them at some point anyways. All so right. let's see here. So if I had to, to guess how you would have scored this, you know, in terms of controversial. I I don't know that it's that crazy. I'd sort of put it in the middle of the middle of the spectrum, so maybe like 145. Yeah, I was I was at about 150, you know, because I just there were a lot of people that were skeptical about it. There were a lot of people who was very optimistic about it too. And I heard a lot of I told you so's when it was when they were nine and two, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, but I don't think, uh, you know, I think there were some warning signs there even in that good start, you sure. know, but uh, yeah, I don't, you know, and I'm not the I'm not the guy that goes looking for the controversial opinion, but, you know, they just, I don't know. I just, I just didn't, I mean, this off season had me questioning you know what i thought i understood about this game a lot and I, I would love to hear i would love to hear the insight into a lot of those decisions and know some of the backstory sure all right well, that went that went pretty well thanks for for doing that part all right now so i have to ask you uh you've been blogging about the hawks for a long time and i don't know the history too well of of the early, early days of Hawks blogging. So I know that you're in it, and I know that uh, Jason Walker is in it. And, and my analogy, and maybe it's not even an apt one, is that if he's the professor emeritus of, of Hawks bloggers, then you're the dean. But uh, oh, man. I don't know if that fits or not. So I was just going to ask you to fill us in on the details of how you got started in Hawks blogging, what what the blog blogosphere was like in those days, uh, and, and what you remember from that. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, that's very kind of you to say. I mean, Jason Walker's the, you know, he's the, he's the gold standard in, in my opinion, in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, I remember I was a fan of his long before I ever met him, you know, and I was, I was lucky to get the opportunity to help run the site with him for, you know, a long time. Uh, but uh, I got my start actually in uh, January of 2010 for fan side. We launched Soaring Down South. Okay. Um, I finished that season out and got the opportunity to join Jason at Peachtree Hoops, and I've been there ever since. Now, you know, it was a little different uh, back in those days. Um, uh, Drew Ditzel was at um, Peachtree Hoops, and, and uh, people know him on Twitter as Hawks Dogs. Okay. Um, yeah, and he, he, moved, he, he moved on, and uh, I sort of took his place there. Then, of course, Brett Legree 
he was a, a Hoopinion. Um, but there was a wasn't a very large uh, contingent of Hawks bloggers in those days. And I don't guess there really still isn't, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, you know, but it's it's been a fun ride. Uh, that's the thing I, I you know, and I, I credit people like Jason and and Brad and yourself and you know Robbie Cal and Bo Cherney for keeping it fun. Uh, because I've been doing this a long time and, uh, you know, and I'm still having fun doing it and that's why I'm still, I'm still here. And, uh, you know, when it's not fun and, you know, I probably look to do something else, but, uh, uh, you know, it's been a kind of a wild ride. Uh, I've seen a lot of good basketball. I've seen some, you know, the 60 win team Eastern conference finals was still my highlight. Um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of heartbreak too. So, you know, a lot of players come and go, uh, but it's, it's been a lot of fun. So were you already a Braves blogger when you got into this and sort of know, knew what you were getting into? No, I did not. First? I knew nothing. The Hawks came first. I oh, knew okay. absolutely nothing. I knew absolutely <laughs> nothing about what I went into. And, I mean, I went in with the goal of putting one post up on that side a day. And it's amazing now when we've put up seven or eight <laughs> <laughs> you know, or sometimes, and I think about those old, those days, you know, and, um, you know, and, uh, but I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing too. There's some nights I'm standing on the press row, you know, and I'm looking around at these people I see on TV and I'm thinking, wow, you know, why am I here? How did I get here? You know, and it's just, uh, it's amazing. And I'm, I'm very grateful to the Hawks for being, uh, you know, open to this. And I'm grateful for, uh, uh, Jason, you know, for, uh, for being as good as he was and earning, earning trust and, you know, the Hawks letting, taking a chance on me when they didn't really know who I was. Uh, but we've always had a lot of access and, uh, you know, and that's, that's made it great. And that the people that read our sites, you know, I think it's a, you know, it's essential and, uh, the way, you know, we're able to present some things different than a lot of people that are just confined to watching at home. Excellent. All right. So you we <laughs> as we said earlier in the 100 to 200 you know I, I think we're going to hit on a lot of those topics cuz if you look at the list of questions I have laid out for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and so you know what is it that 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 is keeping this Hawks team in the 500 neighborhood and and keeping them from from being any better than that Yeah I mean it's a great question and I mean I I don't really I mean I come in with the idea uh, this season that they were going to struggle offensively you know that was one of my biggest gripes I felt like that they just didn't do enough to help the offense I thought Dwight Howard was a, a, a great addition as far as rebounding goes I knew they weren't going to slip a whole I didn't think they were going to slip a whole lot defensively with him um, but offensively I knew there would be nights that they would probably have a hard time scoring uh, but, you know, we, we've kind of seen, man, at times we've seen really good defense. At times we've seen really good offense. At times we've seen bad of both. Uh, I wrote last week, I kind of feel like they've lost their identity. They don't know what they are anymore. And, and in my mind, they're a defensive first team. Uh, they've got to get stops. They've got to get rebounds. And then they need to push the ball and, um, you know, and look for easy shots. And uh, and I think their, you know, their offense is fueled by their defense, so to speak. Uh, but, you know, we've seen in the last few weeks a lot of lineup changes. Uh, some of them was due to the, the slump they were in, the 1 in 10 stretch. Um, some of them was due to injury. And I think one of the uh, strengths of this team is, has always been its continuity. And, uh, you know, I think that's been disrupted a little bit. There's a lot of new faces, but, I mean, you've got a lot of guys in different roles now. Uh, you got Kyle Corver coming off the bench. you got Davos Evolution in the starting lineup. I just think it changes things. Uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. has been in and out uh, of the lineup. Uh, I thought he's been a black, uh, kind of a bright spot. And and I see Bud. Bud's kind of tinkering with stuff. I mean, um, you know, Dwight, Dwight's been out for two games. We're going. They've gone small. Um, Chris Humphreys hasn't played in a long time, and that's kind of left me wondering, you know, if Chris Humphreys can't play when Howard and Splitter are both out, you know, uh, why is he on the roster, you know, kind of in that situation? Because I feel like, you know, one thing he can do is rebound. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's just a lot of question marks and I feel like Bud's kind of searching for answers also, um, you know, and, uh, 
Uh, but, you know, I, again, I don't think it's any one thing you can point to. Uh, I think it's just a culmination of a lot of things and a lot of different players trying to, you know, do their own thing to try to get them out of the slump. Yeah, you mentioned the, the team's identity, and I, I kind of feel like, you know, they're they're still searching for that pass first mentality on offense and I think you know they still have the intention of being a great passing team and at times you see it but you know it changes a little bit when you don't have the right spacing you know you're you're passing to people who maybe don't want the shot as much if they're open and you're you know you're you're passing to players that may not be as open as much because you don't have the floor spread yeah, I definitely. I mean, I agree with that too. And uh, you know, and then I mean, yeah, I think Dennis Schroeder's played really well, uh, especially of late. But I mean, he's also, you know, that's a different. That's a pretty significant change. I mean, Dwight Howard's a pretty significant change from Al Horford. But you know, uh, incorporating Schroeder into this as a starter too. I mean, that's had an effect as well. Um, so you know, I, I mean, it's like you said. I mean, there's not the ball movements there. Uh, there's nights that it just doesn't seem to be, and there's nights, uh, you know, they just simply can't space the floor. And then there, I mean, there's a night they'll score 120 points, you know, and inexplicably give up 131. And, you you know, you're kind of wondering, like, well, you know, <laughs> how did that happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that, that a lot of their pass, their pass first identity, it gets tricky when teams start to switch on them. Sometimes late in games in the fourth quarter, you'll see them switch more. And I think that puts a lot of pressure on Schroeder and Millsap to to generate offense in the mismatches. And, you know, they're both been pretty good at it, but I think it's a heavy burden and it kind of bogs things down a little bit. And they have some other one-on-one players. I think Hardaway's been really good in those types of situations, you know, off the dribble, finding pull-ups in the paint and things like that. But it's... It's tricky, yeah. It's it's you know they want to be this offensive team, and they they seems like their heart's in the right place, but I just don't know that they have that much offensive talent. And then the other the other thing with the switching thing is I think that you know especially if they're behind, that kind of that kind of takes Dwight out of the game late in games. You you know a lot of times they're behind five or six points in the fourth quarter. Other teams start switching, and you want Schroeder and Millsap to be able to do things one on one after after those switches because they've got a you know Millsap on a little guy or Schroeder on a big guy and you can't really have Dwight in the paint at that point and so he agree. kind of gets played off the floor a little bit yeah and I agree with that and uh you know and it, uh, that's an interesting area too because you know we were wondering just how much how they could get Dwight how how much involved he would be in the team's offense and it seemed like you know early on especially he was and uh um, you know, it seemed like to me that teams have done more of late to kind of take him out of that pick and roll. They're crowding him a little bit more. And I think that's one reason we've seen Dennis's numbers come up a little bit mm-hmm. is uh, because they're paying a little more attention to Dwight. And I haven't actually looked at the film. To, I'm sure you have, but uh, I haven't actually looked at the, you know, to look for evidence of that. That's just kind of a feeling I have from watching the games nightly. But uh uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a really interesting. It seems like the the league has kind of seen what the Hawks were doing over those first ten games. They've made adjustments, and now, you know, it's like you said, uh, you know, in switch. You know, it's the Hawks haven't really come up with a good answer, uh, you know, for how to attack that. And I think that's kind of where we're, you know, kind of where we're at offensively. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's not always isolation. I, you know, Budenholzer has said that, you know, sometimes they want to have a second action after the switch and things like that. I actually think, I think Mike Scott could be good for this team in that role. You know, if, 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 if Howard gets played off the floor and you need a sort of a second big to come in and give you some offense in those situations where you're behind by a few points and you need somebody that can space the floor, make the right pass, maybe give you a second action and a second pick and roll after a switch. I think he can be good in that role. You know, they've tried Tabo in that, and I don't know that he's cut out for that. I mean, as as great as he's been defensively, and, you know, he's been really good offensively putting the ball on the deck and things like that. You know, he doesn't really space the floor and I think Scott could be good in those kind of roles. I wonder if he's going to end up ultimately being the 10th man in the rotation to re- replace Humphreys. 
Yeah, I mean, he's a uh, he's definitely an X factor, and it's it's really interesting. You know, we kind of uh, it seems like the last couple of off seasons we've kind of, you know. Uh, in the preseason, we're trying to write and Mike Scott out of the rotation. And then, you know, the season starts and he ends up being an important piece. And I, I feel like he can add a lot to this Hawks team, actually. Uh, you know, he's hurt to start with. And you had an opportunity to watch him play without him. And, uh, you know, you can see where he could give them a lift. And uh, I agree with you. And that secondary action, you know, he's a, he's a good enough passer. He's a good enough shooter uh, that I think he can, you know, defenses – he can really uh, stretch those defenses and, and make them pay for, you know, some of those switching. And um, so, you know, I, I think as he gets healthy, we're going to see him incorporated more and more. Yeah. And, you know, early in the season, I was with you. It's like, you know, we're always thinking, well, you know, is Mike Scott going to be in the rotation? Is this player going to su- supplant him? Is this person going to take his, you know, his role in the rotation? And, you know, I think early in the season, my instinct was to say, well, Mus- Muscala's, you know, filling that role and Scott's not going to be in the rotation but now the more that we've played into the season it's not so much uh whether or not Muscala or Scott is going to play but I think it's going to be is Scott or Humphrey's going to play and I think it ultimately might be Scott yeah I agree with that I agree with that 100 percent it's it's really interesting I mean I, I looked at Muscala more as a as the backup four Right. You know, coming into the season, but and we've seen Bud go, at times go with just the three big rotation. Um, you know, I think there was a stretch there where he did that, but uh, you know, we've seen him uh, play a lot at the at the uh, center spot too, and and you know, and he's uh, you know a lot of the roles, uh, a lot of the ways very similar to the way they used Al Orford. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I agree with you 100. percent I think I think if Scott gets healthy, I think he's going to get an opportunity to play, and if uh, he plays well, I think he'll stay in that rotation. The other, I, not to make this the Mike Scott show, but uh, the other thing that I like about Scott that we haven't really gotten to see yet just because of timing is I think that, that Dwight is actually the ideal player to put him next to. You know, More than anybody that they had the last couple of seasons, more than anybody that they've got this season, I think you put Scott next to Howard, and that's they really complement each other well. And you know, the two games that Scott's been back have been the two that Howard has missed. And maybe that's part of the reason he got some playing time, but I think... You know, in the end, I think, you know, if Scott gets in the rotation, we're going to see him next to Howard and maybe Muscala with some Millsap. Yeah, I agree with that. And, um, uh, you know, one thing we've learned uh, over Bud's tenure here, yeah, the rotation's going to change. Uh, sometimes it'll be due to injury, uh, but he'll try things, uh, you know, at different points of the season. The guys will come and go. Uh, as far as playing time goes, Humphreys is kind of on the outside looking in now. But I, I think Mike Scott's going to get a chance, even when Howard's back, uh, eventually at some point. And, uh, you know, I think he played, I, I believe, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe it was 18 minutes last night. And I believe that might have been the most uh, so far this season. I know he hasn't, it seems like he hasn't done that a lot. So, uh, you know, hopefully he's getting healthier and getting a little more comfortable. Yeah, and I think one of the things we've seen is that, like you were saying, you know, it's not always due to injury, but like you were saying, Budenholzer likes to get people involved, even if he has a nine-man rotation, a 10-man rotation. Over the course of the season, he wants to have 13, 14, 15 players involved in it, and there'll be hot and cold stretches where somebody's in and then they're not. You know, there were times last season where even like Eddie Tavares had a couple of weeks where he was, you know, on the floor a bunch. And so I think, you know, he tries to keep people involved. He doesn't want people shelved for too, too long so that they get rusty. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, Torian Prince is a great example. Uh, you know, I thought, uh, you know, they were going with those three big, that three big rotation earlier. You know, Prince was uh, Prince was getting some run uh, on a consistent basis. So, you know, I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, and, I, you know, I think he'll continue to do that. But, yeah, I definitely think Mike Scott's going to see uh, more playing time sooner rather than later. All right. So one of the things I saw floating around on the Internet the other day was a question where people were being asked, if you could pick Dennis Schroeder or Jeff Teague just for this season alone, which one of those two players would you pick? Man, I'm going to, you know, I may get I may catch some flack for this, but I'm going to go I'm going to go with Schroeder. I'm still going to go with Schroeder. I feel like Dennis has been um I feel like Dennis has been fine. Um you know, I've seen some crazy things uh, this season and and I, that's not to undersell the job Jeff Teague did. 
but I just feel like Dennis is a more dynamic player. I think he's a you know a, a, he's aggressive. Uh, it seems like night in, night out. Sometimes that's to his own dre- detriment. Uh, but he's done a better job of, of cutting the turnovers down, and I think he's going to continue to get better. And you know, defensively, he's not been as good as what I was expecting. But uh, you know, I think that's going to come back. The one thing T's got on him at this point is, uh, you know, he's a crafty veteran. He's experienced. He's been through the, you know, he's been through the battles. He's been in the playoffs. You know, he's been in those big moments. But, uh, you know, I look at a guy like Schroeder. uh, I think if he just gets rolling, you know, he can be a problem for a team, especially in a playoff setting. Um, You know, and I've seen a lot of improvements in him. His jump shot, uh, his decision-making. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm all on team Schroeder. I, I, I felt like I was one of the guys that thought the Hawks were smart to, um, you know, lock him up early. Um, you know, I kind of thought it might happen. And then I kind of thought that it was kind of crazy thought to begin with that, uh, you know, Dennis would probably bet on himself and, uh, you know, and take it, go into free age, restricted free agency next year. But, uh, you know, I thought that was a great deal for both sides and, uh, so I'm I'm gonna stick with Schroeder, uh, and 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 like I said, that's not a slide at Jeff Teague. I just I just really believe in Schroeder. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, I think, you know, maybe Teague has the advantage in terms of passing just because he's been in the league longer. But I think if you take the whole package of the fact that I think Schroeder can get to the rim better, I think he's a better defender. I think he's a longer defender. Um. And then, you know, put in the fact, the thing that's really surprised me is that, you know, he's been a pretty reliable shooter from three-point range. Granted, they're wide-open three-pointers, um, but, you know, he's he's over league average, I think. I think he's over 35%. So, you know, even though they're wide-open threes, you know, if he can make them at that rate, then that's not really a drag on their offense at that point if he can do that. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I think that was the biggest question mark uh, coming in with him. I think it was that and his his decision making. And we saw a lot of turnovers early. Uh, But, you know, and it it almost felt like, you know, he was trying to force feed the ball into uh, into Dwight and uh, and at times. And then some of them was just, you know, the careless turnover that we've kind of seen from Dennis uh, over the years. But, uh, you know, I mean, he he's really tightened that up uh, of late, and in, in this month, uh, December in particular, I feel like he's been pretty good. Uh, you know, he, we've already seen him top thirty points a couple of times. I, you know, ideally, I think the Hawks, you know, want him distributing the basketball more. But my, my Budenholzer will tell you, uh, you know, he wants that point guard attacking, and if that means you know scoring. You know, if, def- if that's what the defense is going to give them, I think, you know, the Hawks are fine with that. And uh, they're fine with uh, Ryden Schroeder in those situations. And uh, we've seen him play a lot of minutes of late, too. Um, so, you know, I think I think they're on board with, with what Schroeder's done. I think they want him to keep getting better. But, uh, you know, the biggest uh, the biggest thing that jumps out to me, like you said, is is that perimeter shot. Uh, I've seen it. He's shown a nice little pull-up jump shot of late, too. And he's been able to knock down the three-point uh, shot at a, at a reasonable clip. And I think as long as he continues to do that, the Hawks are going to be fine. Yeah, I like that that point you made about, um, you know, sometimes you you know he has to be a scoring point guard because that's what the defenses are are giving you if you flip it on its head you know the the game this week that the hawks played against the thunder they were playing a defense that was deliberately schemed in such a way that they were going to force russell westbrook to take a lot of shots they didn't want him to be a passer they wanted him to be a scorer and i think that's somehow <clears throat> that's sometimes how the uh, teams are playing the hawks is they're saying you know what uh you know, we're going to, we're going to try to play Schroeder to score. We're going to try to take away, you know, the pass. And, you know, I, I think he's been good at scoring in those situations. It, it's, it's still a big load for a 23 year old to, to do that though. But yeah, no, oh, no sorry. doubt. No, you're, you're right. Uh, no doubt. And I mean, I wanted to mention this too, and then see, so get your thoughts on this, but uh, I feel like he's finishing better at the rim. Uh, than what we saw his first couple of seasons in the in the league. I think that's one of been a big difference. I mean, he's 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 using his left hand, uh, and I've seen him finish in traffic a, a few times this week. And uh, you know that was something else that jumped out at me. 
Yeah, it seemed like he was rimming out shots left and right the first couple of weeks of the season when they were 9-2, and two, actually. You know, he was missing a lot of shots at the rim, and they were still winning. But I think lately, yeah, he's definitely been, been putting those shots down. He's he's so good at reaching around players, you know, scooping around behind them uh, and finishing with both hands. And, and, you know, he's got a floater. He, he just really mixes it up well and keeps people off balance. And I love the trade. I mean, I, I think that trade that brought in Torian Prince – you know, we're going to look at that in three years and go, wow, that was a heist. Yeah, agreed. Agreed 100%. I, I don't know. You know, he gets a lot of Damari Carroll comparisons, and I think, you know, two years from now, he won't get that because he's going to be a better player than Carroll was. Yeah, I'm really, really high on Prince, and, uh, you know, and I, I I would like to see more of him. Uh, I understand, you know, with this many wing options, but, uh you know, I, that's a whole nother, I guess that's a whole nother subject, but, uh, you know, I would like to, I'd like to see even more of Prince, uh, you know, the sometime at some point this season. No, I, I always get the feeling that Bud is sort of one player away from, from putting him in the rotation. You know, a center gets hurt and the, you know, sort of players shift around and Millsap plays center and other people play power forward and Prince is in and a point guard, you know, if they're short of point guard, you know, Hardaway shifts down and Prince's and I feel like he's always that next guy that's ready to to get put into the rotation no matter what. You know, they have so many wings that, you know, if a, a point guard gets hurt or a big man gets hurt, it's really still a matter of putting another ro- wing in the rotation and then just shifting around the roles for everybody else. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's significant. You know, he's not made a trip to the D League, and I, I think that echoes your point right there. It's just like he's one, you know, in-game adjustment away from always being in the game. Yeah. And uh, you know, and I think that's uh, I think that's uh, I think that's where it's at. All right. So you said before that you were disappointed in the Hawks offseason. We're going to ad lib a little bit here. I'm going off script. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if if the Teague for Prince swap was a good one. Uh, and, you know, presumably you like the Schroeder extension in that context. What didn't you like about the Hawk summer? If, if you know, uh, the, the decision to go and lock up Schroeder was a good one. Yeah, I agree. Um, um, you know, I, I really love the draft. I think I need to, you know, uh, you know, uh, edit that and, and mention, uh, mention in that I really love the draft. I really, I think a lot of Prince and I think a lot of DeAndre uh, Bembry, uh, what little we've seen of him so far. Uh, kind of like the Malcolm Delaney signing. Um, you know, I'm a l- little bit concerned with his percentages. Um, you know, but I mean, the Kent Bazemore extension, I understand it. I understood it a, a whole lot. I like Kent. I uh, really like what he's given. Uh, but I had concerns last year, at the end of last year, if, you know, if that was his ceiling. I wondered if there was, a, you know, another step forward in there. And then, you know, I mean, the Dwight thing, let me, you know, I, I've been accused of just, you know, being anti-Dwight Howard. And that's not really the case because I always kind of felt like Dwight was getting a bad rap at some of these other at uh, some of these other stops, you know, and even in, in Orlando. I didn't think he handled that situation great. Uh, but, you know, I still think he's a productive player. He's just different. And, uh, you know, I just thought, you know, you and I have talked about it. Al Horford just meant so much to this team. And his value went beyond that stat, uh, the stat sheet. And, uh, you know, and you really had to watch him every day to, uh, you know, to recognize that. You couldn't watch, you couldn't pick up and start watching, the, you know, in the East semis against Cleveland and, and it really resonate with you. You had to watch him since uh, training camp. And, uh, you know, and I think they're missing a lot of his intangibles. And, um, you know, I don't really know what led, uh, you know, the the change. And Al may have already had one foot out the door and they may have knew that. Uh, but, you know, it just felt offseason kind of felt disjointed in that. I felt like they needed to add wing. Um, I thought they needed to add some scoring. And, uh, you know, and I thought everything else would take care of itself. And it, it felt like they kind of felt like that uh, they needed to improve rebounding. And they have improved rebounding, but the record's gotten worse. Um, you know, defensively, we hear a lot about rim protection. And then, you know, the numbers would show that the Hawks were just fine in rim protection last year with Al not being a true center. You know, but I think uh, the versatility that he and Millsap had, I just didn't see the problem there. And, uh, you know, I just don't like – I feel like they backed themselves a little bit into a corner here. If if Baysmore 
uh, and he struggled so far this year. But if he, you know, if this is what he is, uh, and last year's kind of his ceiling, um, you know, and then now you've got a decision coming with Paul Millsap uh, at that end. It's even a bigger contract than, uh, you know, what Al Horford could have commanded. You know, I just don't, it, it's just a weird, you know, an, uh, un, uh, I don't know, unappealing uh, situation that I think they're in right now. And, uh, you know, I think they've done a lot of good things, but I think, uh, you know, just the abrupt change of um, direction uh, that they made, you know, we're, we're uh, pass first, uh, you know, tr- uh, this this new age spread the floor, you know, shot to all of a sudden now we're going with a traditional center and we're going to worry about rebounding and crashing the offensive glass. You know, and I think that's what you're seeing a little bit is, uh, you know, the pieces don't necessarily fit together as well as, uh, as a lot of people are hoping. Yeah, the one thing that, that I, I don't know, regret isn't the right word, but the one thing that I really would have liked to have seen and the timeline just didn't allow it is I would have liked to have seen a year, at least one full year of shooter at point guard with Horford at center. And, you know, there were times last year when Bud would ride Dennis because he had the hot hand and you'd get to see some of that. But I just think the combination of, of Horford pulling big men outside and what Dennis can do in the paint, especially when there aren't other big men in there. I think that was an intriguing combination that we never really fully got to see. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, that's something, uh, you know, it seems like that's kind of been the story, you know, for this franchise for a while. It's just, a, it, I don't know, you get close, you get close, and, and maybe what the Hawks had wasn't going to work in the playoffs. I think, you know, we kind of saw that. I mean, Cleveland, they weren't a good matchup for the Cavs, even though a lot of those games were a little more competitive than a lot of people wanted to want to make them out. Uh, but, you know, I, I just didn't like the change in direction, and I, and like I said, you know, I'm not privy of the uh, you know the internal discussions and and you know what was going on, and and then perhaps if if I was, then I would feel completely different. I want to take a minute to talk about today's sponsor, Poli Mortgage Group. Poli Mortgage Group encourages people to shop rates when they're looking to refinance or buy a new home. They have some of the lowest rates in the country and some of the lowest closing costs too. They will even give you a quote where they'll credit you money towards the closing costs or cover all of them. Check them out at www.polimortgage.com. That's www.polimortgage.com. Or call 781-232-8000. Make sure to tell them that ATL and 29 sent you to receive a credit of $50 towards your closing costs. Offers cannot be combined with other offers. Poli Mortgages, Rates, Integrity, Service. All licensing information is in the show notes. Poli is an equal housing lender. All right. So, Chris, where exactly in the Eastern Conference do the Hawks lie? And by that, I mean if you were to break the Eastern Conference's 15 teams into some sub-collection of tiers, you know, Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4, how would you split up the Eastern Conference and where would the Hawks sit? Okay, um, you know, I thought this was an interesting question. I mean, to me, the I still think the Cavaliers are in a tier all by themselves. Uh, then I would go with um, the the Raptors, and I've got the Raptors and the Celtics. You know, I feel like if Boston can get uh, some pro, prolonged healthy uh, healthy month or two under their belt with all their players, I think they're uh, they're poised to make a run. I feel like they're solid in second tier. Uh, and then, you know, it's it's kind of a mess from there. I think that tier three is where the Hawks are. And I think that's like starts at the Hornets, who are fourth currently, and goes all the way down to the Pistons, who are 11th. And I think that's going to be a bloodbath <laughs> <laughs> to find out who, who is going to be the thing. And I would not be shocked. I mean, I thought this was this is something nobody really talks about. But uh, what was there, a three- or four-way tie last year? Um, you know, the Hawks were a part of that in the middle yeah, of the standings. Yep, three, and, four, uh, five, six. Yeah, and I mean, I think you're going to see that again. And, uh, you know, and then I think that lower part, that Magic magic Heat, Nets, Sixers, I think they're in that lower tier. I don't think those are playoff teams. 
Um, but you know, they may, uh, magic may surprise me, but I think that's, uh, that's that lower tier. But I, you know, I think, you know, if you're really interested in Eastern conference basketball, the most intriguing spots going to be watching these, this middle, this four through 11, you know, that, that group of, uh, of, of teams right there that are going to jostle for position. And I mean, there's what, there's a uh, three games separates them <laughs> right now. And that's yeah. what the Pistons, you know, having lost four straight. So, uh, you know, I just feel like that's going to be a brawl all the way through. I mean, and that's the one positive uh, about the Hawks. I mean, they've gone five and 13 since that nine and two start. You know, and they're still in the eight seed, tied for the eight seed, and they're you know exactly what two and a half games out of the number three spot. You know, so I mean, there's still plenty of time. You know, you put together a good stretch, good month. You know, and you can you can jump up a tier potentially. So Charlotte, New York, Indiana, Chicago, Atlanta, Milwaukee, Washington. I know you lumped them into the same tier, but that's a massive tier. If you had to pick let's say two teams as your favorites for the four spot, which two teams would you pick? Oh man, that's tough. That is so <laughs> tough. I was sitting here looking at this. I mean, I, you know, I want to say, I mean, it, you know, excluding Atlanta, I mean, I, I, you know, I still think a Hawks could get there. Uh, you know, if they could somehow ride the ship, I feel, I just feel like Bud's too good of a coach you know, to not end up, uh, you know, not to end up in the middle of the pack in the East, uh, you know, in the playoff picture. But, uh, you know, uh, the Hornets intrigue me a lot. I'm a big fan of uh, Steve Clifford. I think he does. I think he's a magician in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, the Bulls surprised me early. Now they're kind of scuffling a little bit. I'm not a believer in this. Uh, the Pacers, they Pacers are like a fantasy basketball team to me. I uh, feel like the Knicks are kind of one injury away from, you know, sinking <laughs> sinking to the bottom too. The Pistons were that team for me, but I don't really have a I don't really have an answer for what's going on with them right now either. So, you know, I'm kind of scared to say them. I, I'm going to say, you know, one of your favorite teams, Milwaukee might be the you know, might be the most intriguing thing there. I mean, they've got the star power of Giannis and uh you know, uh, but I, I just don't I don't feel I feel like it's the Hornets and then, you know, I don't know if there is another <laughs> another team that I can lump in there as a favorite, you know, to for that number four spot right now. Yeah, I, I mean, if I if I were to look for teams in that range that could irritate the heck out of the Cavaliers, I think I would pick Milwaukee and Detroit as two teams that would bug the heck out of Cleveland. But I don't know if they can establish themselves in that murky mess of of a cloud that that is that tier from four to eleven. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I mean, and, uh, and the Pistons were kind of my dark horse pick this year. Sure. Um, you know, I thought Stan Van Gundy had done a great job there and uh, uh, really liked all the way their pieces fit together. But they've been kind of a mess since Reggie Jackson came back. And, uh, you know, it's kind of inter- be- bewildering a little bit. Uh, the Wizards. You know, there's another team we didn't talk about. They they've been off to a slow start, but they're they're looking better of late. They're trending upward a, a bit. And then anytime you've got John Wall, Bradley Beal, you know that's a strong backcourt. And I feel like they you know that gives you a chance. But these teams are going to beat each other up so much, you know that I you know right now the six the Pacers are a six and they're they're a 500 team. And I think they're I think they're the biggest fraud in that group. Oh, I think that the Knicks are sort of. Yeah, yeah. Kind of I don't want to get too. I, I could see the Knicks and Pacers ending up near the bottom of that clump. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I could too. And I, I feel like, you know, the Knicks are kind of, uh, you know, just held together with tape, you know, in a lot of ways. <laughs> you could see it all fly <laughs> apart, you know. But, uh, um, you know, I do really like Jeff Hornacek, though, you know, and uh, sure. they've got a lot of, they got a lot of veteran guys uh, as well. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It's just a it's just a collection of teams that all have flaws. Uh, they all have their issues, and they all have their positives as well. And I just think they're the problem's going to be they're all going to beat each other up so much uh, that you know it's going to be really hard to to climb. And, you know, I think it's kind of important that you separate yourself from this crew. You know, as before the season gets before we get too far into the season. Yeah, I'm weirdly intrigued by Chicago. They remind me, how to explain this, they remind me of the first, 
Uh, the first isn't. They remind me of the 2015 version of the Cavaliers in the playoffs that lost to Golden State, where it was, you know, sort of slow it down, a lot of iso ball. You know, it was LeBron just creating for everybody else, kind of going one on one, and then just crashing the offensive glass. I think they have some of that in Wade and Butler, you know, being able to do things one-on-one. They're a really great offensive rebounding team. Robin Lopez is kind of a a flexible center who can kind of do a lot of good things that maybe don't necessarily show up in the stat sheet. If they could somehow get a point guard and make Rajon Rondo go to another team, I, I would really like them to come out of the pack. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree. With, I I think so. They're they're an intriguing team, and it's you know it's it's amazing just how good Jimmy Butler is if you watch him. You know, right. a, a lot. Uh, that that's a team. You know, but it's interesting with that team too. I look at Fred Hoiberg, and I'm thinking, you know, uh, he hasn't got to play the way he wants to play no. yet. <laughs> you no. know, and they keep they keep giving him these players, and he has to adapt to them. You know, he's yet to uh, have the opportunity to really uh, put this team, put the team out there that he wants to play the way he wants to play. Man, the East is a mess. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) All right, back to the Hawks for a minute before we let you go. Uh, I wanted to play this clip of Mike Budenholzer talking about Kyle Korver playing some at power forward. I knew the Oklahoma City game was an aberration because Dwight didn't play, but in the game before that, Kyle was guarding Frank Kaminsky, and the game before that, he was on the floor with uh, Schroeder, Hardaway, and Delaney at the same time. Is he playing more power forward? And yes. Is it, what do you expect from him in that role? And can he do both sides, offense, defense? Or <coughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, I guess at some point, I guess you have to call somebody a position, but, you know, they – uh, he's just he's being Kyle, and uh, you know we're trying to keep the court, uh, you know, play, play with the pace, probably even greater pace and more space, and you know hopefully maybe he can shake free for some shots. And then defensively, that's the thing that I've always just kind of marveled at how Kyle just he, how hard he competes and how he lays his body on the line. He'll do anything you ask him to do defensively, and. I just uh, and so you know if it's guarding a Kaminsky or a you know um, whoever it is a Sabonis uh, a Roberson he'll just whatever the assignment is he takes it and he does it to the best of his abilities and um, you know so we'll see if we can mix and match and find a way to put a group out there that can you know we we need to be good defensively um, and obviously he gives you an advantage or gives you space and um, that group can give you great spacing. All right, Chris, what do you think about? Kyle Korver playing some at power forward. Man, if you had told me coming into the season that Kyle Korver would see minutes uh, at power forward, I would have told you you were crazy, especially <laughs> with the, the direction that this offseason went into. You know, it looked like the Hawks were – it was like the Hawks were loading up with these big guys. They were going to talk about rebounding. It, it seemed like the small ball uh, was a thing of the past. You know, and here we are, you know, here we are uh, so f- a third of the way into the season. And we're, we, you know, we've already tinkering with all of these uh, these small lineup configurations. And Corver's actually started a couple of games at Power Ford. I mean, that's a that's that's crazy to me. I, I still can't wrap my head around it uh, a whole lot. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, hey, when you're struggling, I mean, I don't think you should leave any stone unturned. And I think that's, uh, again, I think Bud's just uh, searching for answers. Uh, you know, I th- always think Kyle Corver's a better defender than a lot of people think he is, uh, you know, especially from a team aspect. Uh, you know, I think he can handle it for short stretches. Um, you know, it didn't look real good against the uh, Timberwolves uh, last night. But, uh, you know, still. It's uh, it's it, for during short stretches. I'm not sure that's the way you want to start out, but uh, you know, if the Hawks want to get crazy and get get small and uh, really spread the floor, and uh, you know, I think uh, you know, sure, why not? Do you think that those minutes might go down a little bit when Mike Scott comes back into the rotation? Yeah, I mean, and that's the you know that's the that's the question. Maybe you know we wouldn't have to be doing that if if Mike Scott was healthy and uh, was in rhythm and playing as well. So yeah, I mean, I definitely I don't I don't think this is anything you know they're going to suddenly hang their hat on 
you know, and it's something that you're going to see in the playoffs or, or anywhere else. But it is something Bud's got in his back pocket now that he can go to, you know, and has had some varying degrees of success with it, you know, when the matchup dictates itself. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, eventually I think my Scott's going to figure into that spot and can do a lot of the same things, you know, and uh, then that frees Corver, you know, to be elsewhere uh, in the rotation. So, you know, I don't – it's not something that I, I expect to see on a nightly basis, that's for sure. So Corver, how old is Corver? Is he 35 or 36? Uh, 36, I believe. 36, wow. So, you know, he's going to be a free agent this summer. And so maybe he's playing in Atlanta next year. Maybe he's playing somewhere else. Do you think that that move to power forward is something that could keep him in rotations for a few more years going forward? Oh, no, not really. I mean, I just feel like that's, you know, I just feel like that's a, there's some teams that just couldn't do that. You know, I feel like Atlanta's kind of one of those that, you know, I don't think every system could incorporate Kyle Corver as the, as the four man, uh, even in the stretch, in the stretch era, you know, philosophy. Um, but, uh, you know, I th- honestly think the move to the bench might have been some of that. But, uh, you know, uh, looking out for Corver's, uh, you know, future a little more re- re- to uh, reduce some of the uh, stress and, uh, you know, um, load that's on his shoulders. But, uh, um, you know, I mean, he, he he's not going to change his game, even whether he's guarding power forwards or what. You know, he's going to force somebody to have to chase him around and the other team is going to be forced to cross match because they're not going to be – Frank Kaminsky's <laughs> not going to be chasing Kyle Corver around the perimeter, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, but, you know, Corver might, might guard him for a stretch, you know, at the other end if um, until the other team has a chance to really adjust to it. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us. You got anything you want to plug? Uh, just uh, peachtreehoops.com. You know, uh, we're, we're, we're slogging our way through this season, searching for answers just like a lot of other people are. Uh, but, you know, it's, a, it's always a good time over there. Follow, you know, me, Chris Willis, uh, Chris underscore Willis on Twitter. That's Chris with a K and uh, Brad Rowland. And, uh, uh, you know, just uh, you can check us out over there, and we appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's uh, like I said, it's my pleasure, and uh, you know, I really enjoy the podcast. So it's a uh, it's a big honor for me to be a part of it. And thanks to our sponsor, Poli Mortgage Group. Poli Mortgages Rates, Integrity, Service. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, Just go to cars.com. It's magical.